Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Columbia Riverkeepers Love Your Columbia webinar series. My name is Lauren Goldberg, and I'm the Legal and Program Director with Columbia Riverkeeper. Today's webinar, Forgotten Toxic Waste Dump, the Bradford Island Story, digs deep into the history and current fight to protect a remarkable stretch of the Columbia River located near Bonneville Dam. So just over three years ago, Columbia Riverkeeper launched a campaign in solidarity with Yakima Nation to bring public awareness to the toxicity at and around Bradford Island and to advocate for the US Environmental Protection Agency to list the area on the country's most toxic sites list, which is known as the Superfund list. So for today's webinar, we're going to kick this webinar off with a land acknowledgement which is a practice that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Next, I'll introduce our speakers from the Yakima Nation Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we're very honored today to have Davis Washins and Laura Klassner Shira joining us. And they'll be sharing the cultural significance of Bradford Island and surrounding waters, as well as the history of pollution and the current efforts to hold the gov US government accountable. We'll wrap up with questions from all of you. So please feel free if you're joining us on Zoom, you can use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to ask questions and I'll um, make sure to um, share some of those with our speakers in our last five or 10 minutes. And if you're joining on Facebook Live, you can go ahead and put it in the comments section. Um, and then uh, we'll, we're recording this webinar. So if you enjoy it and want to share it with friends or family, I'll send you an email in the next couple of days with a recording of the webinar, along with some resources uh, about the cleanup and um, tribal nations that we discussed today. So starting first with the land acknowledgement, we at Columbia Riverkeeper recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between Native people and their traditional territories. We respectfully acknowledge that the places we are joining today's webinar from rest on the traditional lands of Native people who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. So I'm joining today from Columbia Riverkeeper's office in Hood River, Oregon, which rests on the traditional lands of multiple tribal nations and bands, including the Wasco Wishram, Warm Springs, and Yakima Nation. To learn more about Yakima Nation and other Columbia Plateau tribes, we encourage you to visit the websites for different tribal nations, as well as the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission's website. So with that, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Davis Washins or Yellow Wash. Davis is a member of Yakima Nation and currently serves as the government affairs liaison in the Nat Yakima Nation Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Program Superfund section. Davis served on the executive board of the Yakima Tribal Council and on Yakima General Council as executive chairman. For over 30 years, Davis served in law enforcement, both with Yakima Nation as well as the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission or CRITFIC, including serving as chief of police for both the tribe and CRITFIC. As a youth educator, uh, Davis served as a middle school guidance counselor for the Wapato School District, as well as a Yakima Nation um, native language teacher in the high school. Davis is called upon in tribal communities throughout the region to conduct traditional ceremonies because of his knowledge of his native language, culture, and oral traditional history of native people, land, and natural resources. Following Davis's presentation, Laura Klassner Shira will present on the history of toxic pollution at Bradford Island and Yakima Nation's longstanding work to hold the US government accountable for cleanup. Laura is an environmental engineer and hydrologist. Uh, she joined uh, the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program uh, just over six years ago to assist in their efforts to honor, protect, and restore the Columbia River Basin. Laura's work focuses on the cleanup of contaminated industrial sites and other environmental issues that impact the Columbia. 
And prior to joining the tribe, Laura actually served as a regulator with the Washington Department of Ecology and prior to that as a consultant. One thing you'll notice is Laura presents, and I had the honor to present with Laura a couple of years ago here in Hood River, is that in a past life, Laura was a high school math and science teacher. Uh, so she does a phenomenal job of explaining some really complicated issues in a way that for those of us who uh, might not be environmental engineers can understand them. So we are so grateful today to have Davis and Laura presenting. And with that, I will pass it to you, Davis, to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you to the Columbia River Keeper for this opportunity to tell the Bradford Island story of the toxic waste dump there. As you acknowledge the land, I also have a personal acknowledgement that I have to make before we begin. And I would like to do that in our traditional language because I want the creator to hear me directly as I uh, am what am I about to do here. When Nixers Yalawash, the Kwanana Kushnis Kutanawa Shachi, and the Kuchiman and the Kushpa Atkesha, subsequent, and the Kwanana Kushna Mi, Mimi, Taman with La Inia, Ka, Kicham, Kuana, in Putta, Waikanash, Kuana and Chush, and the Kushin Chush in the Knoisha, Kuchi and the Kushna, subsequent, the Chiman, and the Kwanana Ku Mimi, and the Kushpa Sinuhana Chinchimaman. Na chao autika na kushna mi piapi tamanuia chnati chamna na kwana na kushnus kawanas watwi na kusin klaikus. So what I said in my language was that I'm very grateful this opportunity, and as our elders had always instructed us, to what one elder, most of you uh, are familiar with this name, Billy Frank, our Nisqually relative, and he always encouraged us: tell your story. Tell your story. So that's what we're going to do this uh, this afternoon. So Lauren, you set the table. So at this lunch hour, uh, we're going to have the menu of awareness and knowledge about the Bradford Island story. The history of this land, the Columbia River, or to us native people, it's called Nichiwana, is the history of the people of the Yakama Nation. Our history through thousands of years of the oral tradition teaches us the connection to Nchiwana, the land, the natural resources, such as the salmon. We have been taught from the very beginning about our first foods, which salmon is a essential element of. So from the beginning of time, we have relied on the land the Columbia River and the natural resources as our way of life. And so this afternoon, uh, one of the important uh, aspects that I hope to come across is how important this Bradford Island area and all of our other areas are, are to us. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, since time immemorial, we have a sacred relationship that has been established between our people, the salmon and the Columbia River. So what is this sacred relationship? Well, we talk about the sacrifice that the salmon made for us at the beginning of time and as our first, food, first foods at all of our feasts and all of our important ceremon ceremonial uh, meals, they they are the first to be served in recognition of their uh, sacrifice and their willingness to be uh, a part of our way of life. Among my relatives and friends, uh, I'm known as Yellowwash of the Klickitat tribe, one of the 14 signers to the U.S. Yakima Treaty of 1855. Bradford Island and the surrounding area is what we call a usual and a custom fishing place used since time immemorial. Today, one of our responsibilities, like most of you, is to speak for those that can't speak for themselves. But they are, they are speaking to us if we would only listen. 
They are telling us something. They're telling us that something is wrong. And that uh, because they have to travel through this uh, toxic the waters uh, near the Bradford Island. Next slide, please. My Klickitat lineage is on my father's or paternal side, but on my maternal lineage or my mother's side is from upriver at a place called Skinpa or the cradle board, which is directly across from the Celilo village in Oregon. 1957, the Dalles Dam inundated the Great Celilo Falls and my mother's people lived uh, near the Great Celilo Falls and I experienced it as a child uh, before we had to relocate to the reservation. My grandfather's grandfather, Chief Maninik of the Skinpas, he was the sixth signer of the Treaty of 1855. And you see on the map by, by the treaty, these treaty territories were created and they exist today. And as you see, Bradford Island is in the usual and the custom area. Article three of our treaty says that we reserve the right to fish and gather at all usual and accustomed areas. But we also have the right to have safe, toxic free fish. So the water has to be safe and toxic free. It has taken us many legal fights to secure and protect these rights. Many US Supreme Court decisions and other court decisions have reaffirmed that we have a right to gather at all of our usual and accustomed places. Now these unmapped areas extend uh, over in many areas. We just recently been um, going to the Great Plains to for Buffalo, which we had done before the treaty was signed, and we were and we still guarantee we still carry out that reserved right. So if you're more interested in how these rights were secured in our usual and area, usual and custom areas, such as Bradford Island area, I encourage you to uh, review the two important Supreme Court cases, uh, US v. Oregon and US v. Washington. By those, we were designated as, the Yakima Nation was designated as a co-manager of the Columbia River Basin. As you see on the map, it extends clear over into uh, Idaho. All the Columbia River and its tributaries are a part of being a co-manager. Next slide, please. This year is 166 years since the, the Yakima US Treaty was signed. And believe me, you can learn a lot in 166 years. So as a retired police officer, as was mentioned earlier, let's go and review what I, in my opinion, call the scene of the crime. Here you have pictures of the Columbia River prior to the construction of Bonneville Dam. Bonneville Dam was started in June of 1934 and it was completed in 1937. And this kind of depicts what was typical in all the areas that these met dams on the Columbia River, on the Snake River, had changed uh, the uh, landscape. And as mentioned earlier, uh, Dallas Dam had inundated the Great uh, Celilo Falls. And so these changes were very, uh, very harmful to the Yakima Nation in terms of how they affected. Uh, uh, not only the water, but also the salmon and the other natural resources that live in the water. And so, but the technical aspects uh, will be more reviewed by our next speaker, Laura. There she will lay out uh, uh, the evidence, as I call it, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from, this, <laughs> from this crime scene, if I may. So who are the victims? Who are the victims here? First of all, it's the water. In our way of belief, we understand that water is life, as we all know. The other victims are the things that rely on the water, the fish, the salmon, and all the other uh, natural resources. 
and then us as humans, especially members of the Akama Nation who revere the salmon as one of our first foods and our neighbors who also rely on some of the resource as contained in the residence fish. So indeed, uh, to me, this is uh, uh, an example of uh, the very uh, cause of this, uh, as you will hear from our next speaker. Next slide, please. We still practice today our traditional platform fishing as we had for centuries. And as you see in the picture here, uh, what it depicts to me as a retired law enforcement officer is his safety. You see the gentleman here uh, with his catch, he's on a scaffold uh, and he is, uh, if you can see the rope that is tied to him. So we enforce the laws of the accommodation on safety to make sure that when our people are uh, out there harvesting that they're safe. And so <clears throat> one of the mantras that I followed when I was a police officer was what I called a Robocop. Some of you may have seen that movie. His mantra was uh, uphold the law, protect the innocent and maintain the public trust. So in my opinion, what the Bradford Island toxic waste dump is, is uh, environmental laws are being broken by the toxic dump site at Bradford Island. And so we look at the review, the, uh, the mantras of Robocop. We have to uphold the law as they apply to having uh, toxic free waters. And we have to provide uh, and protect the innocent. The man with, you see here, he's, he's got his catch. And uh, what he's gonna do with that catch, he's gonna provide it to his family. He's gonna provide it to his children and elders and others. Or maybe he's going to catch, uh, use his catch for a first foods ceremony. Maybe he's having a memorial or maybe some significant events. Maybe his child has graduated from college and he wants to put on a big dinner. So, the food that we take from the water has to be safe. It has to be safe for everybody. And is it? Uh, and I'm sure the next speech speaker will tell you that it's not. Next slide, please. Here we have another uh, example of a scaffold fishing. This is a uh, Goose Island, which is just upriver uh, from the Bradford Island. I uh, hope everybody can see the invisible man on the scaffold. He's there. <laughs> I was assured he was out there. So, but uh, the reason that um, we included this is that this is platform is upriver from Bradford Island. Now, this is the same water that the fish have to pass through. This toxic waste dump they have to pass through, not only to migrate out to the ocean where. Um, they spend, you know, any time from three to five years before they return. And they also have to come back up the river to their place of birth to spawn and to do their responsibility, just as the creator had instructed them to do. So what has been presented so far, the historical, the cultural, and the spiritual, spiritual significance that places that, like Bradford Island area have for members of the Yakima Nation, as it has had since time immemorial. A very prominent leader once told me, he said, you can be for something like all of us. We're for clean water, clean air, clean environment. We wanna be clear of the pandemic. We all want to be for something, but what have you accomplished? And that's the question that he always asked. What have you accomplished? And so I hope today this presentation, and again, I wanna thank Lauren Columbia River Keeper for this opportunity. I hope that we want to bring awareness to everyone about the danger of having this toxic waste dump at Bradford Island. And with the awareness and with the knowledge that this is harmful to the water, to the 
to the resources, to the humans, that there is a, will be a call to action along the way, whatever your capacity is. As a citizen, as an elected official, somebody that cares for our environment and, and for the safety of uh, our natural resources and the people that rely on them, such as the Yakama Nation. Next slide, please. There was a famous group called the Beatles, John Lennon. And he was from my generation, maybe some of yours, maybe from your generation also. But he wrote a song and he called it Imagination. And in it, John Lennon asked some very important questions. So on behalf of the Yakima Nation and the Columbia River to which we seek to honor, protect and restore, we want you along with us as the and Columbia River Keeper and others. We want you to imagine a clean and productive Columbia River that sustains us, that protects and restores the Nchiwana to our way of life, the way it was. And that was when we asked an elder in our responsibilities here at Yakima Nation Fisheries about the restoration of our salmon. What do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? And as like all of our elders, it didn't take many words for them to express themselves. And we asked him, what do you want us to do? And this was his reply. Make it the way it was. Make it the way it was. And we hope that someday through our efforts, partnering with uh, organizations such as the Columbia River Keeper and others, uh, working with our federal entities, our local entities, our state entities, Oregon and Washington, that we can make the difference to once again, do our best to make it, to try to make it the way it was, just as our elders had instructed us to do. And so in closing, again, I want to thank uh, Lauren of Columbia River, and I really appreciate this opportunity. And so uh, with that, I will pass this on to our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Davis, and thanks everyone for having me today. My name is Laura Shira. I'm with the Yakima Nation Fisheries Program staff member. Um, hold on, I need to switch slides. Before I start it, before I start into details on uh, Bradford Island itself, I want to give you some perspective of magnitude of why this is such a big concern to us, why this is so important to us, why. We are trying to solicit your help to, to um, help ask the federal government to make this site a national priority um, so that it can get uh, more consistent funding and, and the attention and expertise it needs in order to move it forward to clean up faster, to be more protective of clean, healthy fish. Um, so what I wanna talk about to help get bring this perspective to you is fish tissue concentrations of PCBs, which are called, um, which is the abbreviation for polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, those are chlorinated compounds that are used in a lot of uh, electrical components that involve a lot of heat. Uh, they buffer the heat. Um, they're also used in paints sometimes. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different industrial uses for PCBs. Uh, they were a great chemical for those purposes, so great that they were used very widely. Um, but we found out, unfortunately, as time went on, how incredibly toxic they were at incredibly low concentrations. And so in the late 70s, they were discontinued um, for wide use throughout industries, throughout industry. So this is a map from 2017 from the Washington Department of Health that shows, gives you kind of a relative sense of PCB concentrations in fish around Washington. Uh, you know, sometimes it's good to look at your site compared to other sites to understand, you know, is this a big deal? Is it better? Is it worse? So to start with the 
the human health screening level that helps us understand, you know, should we be looking at this site? Is this, is this a bad concentration, a good concentration? So for human health, um, for those who are eating fish, the screening level is 0 0.57 parts per billion, which might not mean a lot to you. I, I'll try to give you some perspective later in this presentation that might help too. But um, some other really well-known sites that um, are listed on the Superfund National Priorities List are the Lower du excuse me, the Lower Duwamish and Portland Harbor. Um, so the Lu Lower Duwamish, we looked at that site to understand how does that compare to Bradford Island in terms of PCBs and fish tissue. And when we looked at that, the maximum fish tissue concentration in English sole at Brad at uh, Lower Duwamish was 640 parts per billion. So well above that health screening screening level makes sense that it's a priority, a super fun site and getting lots of attention. Portland Harbor, which is um, oh, actually on the Willamette and flows into the Columbia was on this map as well, luckily. Um, that's also a very well-known PCB driven toxicity site. Um, the concentration, maximum concentration in smallmouth bass resident fish at that site is 6,460 parts per billion. So, you know, that's pretty bad too, e even worse than, than that found it in the lower Duwamish. And then, you know, the Bradford Island numbers were so much bigger than that in fish tissue. So we thought, well, what are like the most famous sites in the United States? What are the concentrations there? And two sites that have received the most attention in that Superfund, CERCLA, uh, federal regulatory world for cleanup are the Fox River in Wisconsin. And these numbers I pulled off of graphs so I couldn't get exact numbers, but the maximum fish tissue concentration there in bass was about 14,000 parts per billion. And in the Hudson River, New York, where PCBs were actually manufactured, um, the maximum number there was about 20,000. And so when you look at Bradford Island, that those concentrations in fish really blow those the rest of those super fun NPL listed sites out of the water at 183,000, 1,000, or sorry, 140 parts per billion. So, you know, magnitude wise, these are really, really high concentrations in fish. And this number of 183,000 is not an anomaly. There are, there were multiple fish uh, tissues uh, concentrations that were over 100,000 and many, many more that were above any of these other sites maximum values in, in the population of fish that were sampled at Bradford Island. So all these other sites, except for Bradford Island, Island are part of the, the national priority list. They, they receive a na national priority. They're part of the Superfund program. They, and as a result, because they are a priority, it's, it's more ensured that they receive funding year to year to year. It doesn't matter who's politically in charge of what's going on. In fact, um, one of the years during the Trump administration, the Trump administration actually zeroed out the budget for Bradford Island. And so um, without NPL listing status, some of these sites that aren't listed but are managed federally are really at the whim of politics. And so as a result, of years, decade, actually decades of um, pretty low funding and even one year zero <laughs> dollars appropriated. Um, Bradford Island has really limped along. And in that investigation and um, evaluation of how should we clean this up and clean up process, it's really far behind um, all the other, these other sites that are listed up here. Um, a lot of that's due to lack of funding. Um, let me go to the next slide here. Um, this tells us a little bit about all the different key contaminants at Bradford Island. And, and I know it's a lot of words, I apologize for that. But I wanted to give you a sense of um, what some of the key contaminants were. And the take home from this slide is that all of these contaminants um, affect multiple systems in your body. They affect multiple organs in your body. They especially 
affect young children neurologically, um, immune system wise, um, and fetuses. So those yet unborn, um, if a pregnant mother is to eat fish. And so the way that we are being exposed, the big concern here is for people who are eating fish and that's how they're being exposed. Um, the prime, that's the biggest way they could be exposed. So PCBs I already talked about, those are polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, there's multiple pesticides that were used at Bradford Island throughout time just to manage, you know, weeds and, and, and um, other things on site. So dialdrin and, chlor are, and chlordane are two that stick out. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, metals like lead and arsenic, mercury, phthalates, those were all some of the key con contaminants at Bradford Island that are driving toxicity. There's other contaminants that are also contributing, but those that list there is contributing the largest proportion of toxicity to both the upland and the in-water contamination at Bradford Island. Yakima Nation is um, particularly interested in aquatic health because um, tribal members rely so much on, on fish. And so um, one of the things I wanna point out here, you know, with respect to salmon, especially those migrating fish that aren't really spending a lot of time necessarily at Bradford Island, but are passing through um, the, the things like the migratory fish like salmon, the way it affects those fish when they are exposed to chemicals like this, it increases juvenile mortality. So um, salmon are not growing up to adulthood. They're, they're never making it out to ocean. And if they do make it out to ocean, they may not be as big and they may not be as strong or healthy. And so they're picked off more easily or just don't survive uh, their time out to sea. And then for the same reasons, when they come back to spawn, they may not be successful. They may not uh, make it to spawning. And so we're seeing uh, really reduced fish runs in the Columbia River um, because of contamination from sites like Bradford Island and others. So um, I wanna orient you a little bit to the site here. Um, Bradford Island is a part of that Bonneville Dam complex, which is the lowest, the last dam as you're moving from upstream to downstream on the Columbia River. Um, it's about 146 miles upstream from the ocean. Um, and it, it's formed by some huge rock slabs that fell off the cliffs into the water um, and that form these great islands and really solid formations for, for you know, structural engineers to tie a dam into. And that's why it was picked for, for placement of a dam. And so um, Bradford Island, uh, the contaminated part that the Corps talks about a lot in their environmental reports, the upland unit, the upland operable, operable unit is this brown uh, portion of land on the Eastern or upriver tip of Bradford Island right here. And then the in-river operable unit is this light blue portion that extends from the dam upriver about one mile to the tip of Goose Island here. And Goose Island didn't exist in history. Um, what happened was for, for ship passage, they dug off this uh, southeastern tip. They excavated that out and brought that material over to the shoreline here and they formed um, Goose Island to make way for shipping. And so I wanna talk a little bit more now that we're oriented, I wanna talk a little bit more about, you know, besides high, really high concentrations and ongoing risks, why else are we concerned? Um, and so uh, the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers is the entity that owns and operates Bradford Island. And what's different about federal sites is when a federal agency is liable or responsible for a site, it's not, it doesn't revert to EPA to manage and make decisions and use their science on it. That responsibility remains within that organization. So the Corps of Engineers gets to self-regulate and self-perform on their own cleanup sites, just like the US Forest Service would get to self-regulate and self-perform on, on their cleanup sites. So it's a, it's a unique situation when we have federal agencies like these. And um, unfortunately, you know, as I discussed before, 
funding isn't consistent. Funding is, is very important for cleanup and, and these sites last 20, 30, 40 years, sometimes before they're fully cleaned up. And, and that funding is very much at the political whim of, of whatever party is in charge. Um, and so uh, funding is really important um, and can get cut off or, or lowered or, or raised um, depending on, on what's going on politically. And, and it's a bit of a fox watching the hen house situation sometimes um, because what happens is these federal agencies have different interpretations of CERCLA than EPA would. Um, they actually can make their own guidance on how you implement CERCLA. And so in the case of the core, Yakima Nation really feels that the core's guidance and interpretation of CERCLA is much less protective. And so an example of that is that CERCLA law, the, the federal cleanup law, requires that state laws are recognized um, if they have their own cleanup regulations. And state laws are generally more protective um, than federal law. And so at Bradford Island, Washington and Oregon laws apply. However, the Corps has made their own decision that they don't have to even look at state or federal or state, Oregon state or Washington state laws. And CERCLA also requires that the state and the tribes are funded, um, but the core has interpreted CERCLA differently and has decided not to fund the states, not to fund the tribes. And so those decisions have resulted in two separate litigations. The Yakima Nation um, litigation is completed and a court determination um, was made that requires the, the core to fund the Yakima Nation the state litigation is still ongoing. Um, we have other technical disagreements to date. So the investigation and delineation of process of where is the, you know, where did the pollution come from? Where did it go to? Um, there's some data gaps in that. And we have disagreements on, is that adequate? Do we know enough to start to move to design phase? Um, there's disagreements on the contaminant list. There's disagreements on risk management decisions. There are whole areas of the site that even though um, soils or, you know, or different media exceed screening levels that there's real risk levels that are exceeded, um, the Corps risk management guidance is so different than the state's or EPA's guidance that they've been able to risk away entire areas of, of contamination so that they don't have to do any action, no cleanup in those areas. Um, and the legal framework work, there's disagreements on that um, in terms of what, what regulations apply, should it be NPL listed, that kind of thing. And so what we feel is really needed um, in order to help turn this site in a better direction um, is we really feel that this site needs to be listed on the national priorities list or Superfund list. And that's what we're asking you to help us with today. Um, that would get us obligated and committed funding and consistent funding throughout the years um, that would help us address more of the data gate gaps. It would help bring on more expertise um, to, to this site. This is a really technically difficult site. Um, not only is it right next to a dam, that's a safety concern, but um, it has sediment contamination. It also has fractured bedrock contamination. It has steep slopes down into the bed, you know, into the riverbed. Um, it's it's a tricky site, and we we need to bring on the the appropriate level of expertise to help. So I want to dive a little deeper into the upland area because that's where the contamination really came from. There's four areas of concern. So I'm going to start with the purple area right down here in the bottom left. That's a pistol range where they practiced um, firing. Um, so there's a lot of lead shot there that's a risk to waterfowl. Um, the sand blast area um, was their main industrial area, maintenance area, equipment storage area, hazardous waste material storage area. Um, it's called the sand blast area because they would take sand and they would blast it at the different pieces of equipment to remove the paints, which actually contain quite a few toxic chemicals themselves, um, as well as rust and other things. Um, and then they would take that spent sandblast grit and they would uh, wheelbarrow it or bucket it over to uh, a, a good portion of the site on the east side 
and, and just dispose of it at the surface. They didn't even bury it. So there's up to three feet of sandblast grit right at the surface that um, could easily be transported to the water through you know, rainfall events and storms. Um, and I just want to point out these two outfalls here, outfall one and outfall two, and we'll see in a later map the, the amazing set of sediment footprint there of PCBs just outside of those outfalls. Um, I'm going to go to the landfill in the top right corner, it's yellow. So um, from the 1930s to the 1980s, you know, as we were just standard practice of the day, you know, they, they had landfilling right there on site and they actually had dumping of certain things off the cliffs into the um, water um, in, intermittently where we don't have a lot of understanding of that but that was that was standard practice as we learn more and as more and more env environmental regulations that came along that stopped but those that landfill disposal went right up to the edges of the cliffs so those cliffs are eroding and mass wasting um, right into the water that contamination is and there's so there's some debris piles um, at the northeast tip along the north side here along the landfill. Um, there's also a third debris pile over here by this green area called the bulb slope, which it, interestingly enough, they must have wheelbarrowed their, their spent ballasts and, and light mercury light bulbs and the ballasts can contain PCBs. Um, they, would, they would just dump them off that, that cliff into the water. Um, So a little bit about timeline. Davis talked about the cultural way of life since time immemorial um, around in the area surrounding uh, Bradford Island and along the Columbia River. Um, and again, from the 1930s to the 1980s, we suspect a lot of these environmental activities happened that contributed to the contamination. And, and then we learned more and in the course stopped doing those activities. In 1997, there were some some regulations that came along that required that the Corps of Engineers begin investigating the environmental footprint and impact from their operations at the dam. And so that's when we really started to learn more about uh, you know, how, how bad Bradford Island was and how it got expanded from a landfill investigation to the eastern tip of, of Bradford Island to that one mile operable unit in the river. And in 2000, 2002, 2007, there was a series of emergency removal actions. Um, I wasn't involved in that time, but I know, I think it was the 2007 one that Yakima Nation was very concerned that it was premature to do, that we were worried that removal of some of this equipment without really understanding the situation could actually worsen conditions. And it turns out that that truly did happen, unfortunately. But during that time, you know, more than 40 cubic yards of electrical equipment was removed and diver assisted dredging actually did remove some of the sediment, contaminated sediment from the site. Um, so here's some pictures I want, wanted to share with you that I thought were especially interesting. Here's uh, some assist diver, diver getting ready to go in the water. Um, it's a very, very dangerous area. To, to get divers into. So a lot of safety precautions had to be followed. On the right here, um, this is probably below the, I'm guessing the bulb slope where the bulbs were, were dumped off the cliff. So you can see um, some light bulbs and broken glass. It's a little bit hard to see in here. Um, different types of equipment were also just um, either placed in the landfill or dumped off of cliffs. Um, or fell off of cliffs with that landfill erosion. So um, I wanted to show you some picture of, uh, pictures of these equipment. Much of it was still filled with oil. The oil was not removed before dumping. So they were either, um, some of them didn't actually leak, but some of them actually cracked open and leaked into the, uh, into the riverbed, um, got into the sediments, traveled down the slopes, that kind of thing. But Top left are some inner teen capacitors. You can see a, a person's foot here and a 55 gallon drum here for size perspective. Um, top right, a lightning arrester. Um, that 55 gallon drum probably is about two feet in diameter. So this might be about three feet long. Uh, and this is a coupling capacitor. And just to give you some perspective on, you know, what kind of concentrations were we looking at with PCBs? Westinghouse was one of the manufacturers of PCBs. And they, um, 
their formulation was reported to be about 60 to 75 percent uh, pure <laughs> PCBs. And so in the environmental world, we don't talk about percents. It's often a lot, you know, a lot smaller um, units. And so we talk in this case here at Bradford Island, we talk about concentrations in parts per billion range. So the 75 percent pure uh, PCB mix of oil and PCBs would be 750 million parts per billion. So that was what the core received when they purchased it and then they'd mix it with oils. And what we found or what was found in electrical equipment at Bradford Island was anywhere um, you know, up to about 20% PCBs in that oil mixture. And so that would be about 200 million parts per billion. And those oils were dense oils. So when they were released into the water, they didn't float. They sank to the bottom. They followed that bedrock slope uh, down in, down to you know, the lowest point um, that it, they could go. Um, for sediments, the highest concentration that was ever found was about 690,000 parts per billion in 2003. And post all those removal actions, we did see a reduction in sediment concentrations. But remember, these PCBs aren't just in sediments and there's not actually not a lot of sediment present at Bradford Island. It's also in the cracks and crevices of the bedrock of that fractured bedrock um, bottom of the river. And again, the highest fish concentration, fish tissue concentration in smallmouth bass at Bradford Island was 183,140 parts per billion. That was in 2011. That was after all those removal actions. The maximum concentration before um, at an earlier date, I think it was 2008, was 26,000. So we actually saw fish tissue concentrations go up at, after, after the removal actions. And again, just for reference, that human health uh, risk-based screening level is 0 0.57 parts per billion. So orders of magnitude higher than the screening level. Here's just another photo I thought was interesting. You know, when they did that diver assisted uh, dredging to get sediment out, a lot of water came up in that vacuum hose as they were vacuuming up, up the sediment. And that water had to be treated before it could be put back and really into the Columbia River. So they had a barge with all kinds of we call those baker tanks and, and that water was treated before it was released back to the river. So continuing on our timeline, 2011 was a multimedia sampling effort post all those cleanup actions that happened between 2000 and 2007. Um, it did improve the sediment contaminant concentrations. However, the maximum smallmouth bass concentration went up. There was a, the remedial investigation was completed. That report was completed in 2012 and it included information on both the upland and the in-river. And then with that information from the remedial investigation, the Washington and Oregon health authorities both released a do not eat any resident fish advisory for the one mile area upstream of the dam. And from 2016 to 2021, um, the Corps has been working with the states, with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, with Yakima Nation to understand a couple of the data gaps, not all of them, but a couple of them, and to uh, try to evaluate what the best way to clean up things, uh, uh, contamination on the upland and the in-river um, areas would be. And, and they're a little farther along with that evaluation of what to do on the upland than they are for the in-river. This is a 2014 um, visual, it's PCBs and sediments. And um, uh, it's too small to read the numbers, but what I wanted to show you was post all those emergency cleanups, we can still see the footprints of PCBs um, outside the sandblast area, the two outfalls that I pointed out earlier at debris pile number three in the bulb slope area. Here's another hot spot for PCBs and sediments. And at the landfill area where, near debris pile one and two along that area is another PCB and sediment hotspot. So greatly reduced from earlier, but still a problem that um, exceeds any kind of sediment criteria by orders of magnitude. I wanted to talk a little bit about the fish consumption advisory, what it is and what it isn't really quickly. Um, the 
advisory was a very rare, it's a very rare type advisory. Usually they're, you know, only eat so many fish per week or month, but this was a do not eat any fish advisory because of the extremely high PCB fish tissue concentrations. So you can see on the map, this Bonneville Dam, Bradford Island advisory. It's one, it's the one mile area from here to here. And if you were to look at a, a Google map and zoom in on these shorelines, you'd see all these little white lines sticking out on a, you know, on an aerial map, like a Google map. Um, all those little white lines that are sticking out are actually fish platforms. So there are a lot of fish platforms all along the Washington side. There's um, not as many, but still this, the, the uh, Oregon side is just spar uh, spotted with fish platforms as well. And that Goose Island actually has a couple um, fish platforms is on it as well. So all, you know, so the nearest ones are within a third of a mile. And for bigger context, this is the Mid-Columbia Reach. Um, the Bonneville Dam, Bradford Island is down here. So there's that little one mile advisory here. But from River Mile 146 to 292, all the way up to the McNary, dam there's these this low level problem much lower concentration than at bradford island or any of those other super fun sites we talked about earlier but low level problems of pcbs and mercury that um, accumulate in fish as you go up the 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 food chain and so we have a fish advisory for that that long length there there's not much of the columbia river that doesn't have a fish advisory on it and last, this is my last slide here, actually second to last slide. Just wanted to be clear on what that fish advisory means. So it means do not eat resident fish. So these are the types of fish that stick around that have a small, ra uh, small range. They might only travel a mile or two. Some of them travel further. Um, some of them actually live quite a long time. But um, the big one that we've been looking at in fish tissue concentrations is this smallmouth bass. Um, the ones that are healthy to eat are those migratory fat fish that are just passing through. So healthy to eat are the salmon, the steelhead, the American shad, and the lamprey. Um, this is actually a slide from a March meeting this year where Washington, Oregon, and the Yakima Nation um, governments actually approached the Biden-Harris transition team at EPA to ask for NPL listing for that Superfund listing. And what we asked for was, you know, please add uh, Bradford Island to the list. It's, it's such a priority for us, um, which is an unusual thing for a state to want uh, um, federal involvement in a cleanup site. Um, it asked EPA to recognize Oregon and Washington's cleanup rules. And it asked for EPA to use their, the more protective guidances and rules from EPA and the states that would ensure a cleanup that has a better chance of resulting in clean, healthy fish that are safe to eat. So what we're asking for you today, from you today is to help us out in taking action. There's a link up here in the upper right corner and it'll be on the next slide too. But this is a Columbia River Keeper petition that we're asking you to sign. Um, so with that, that ends my presentation. I'm going to um, turn it back to Lauren for questions and answers. And here's the, the link again at the bottom of this slide for that petition. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you, Davis, for your presentations. Um, a lot of a lot of information, really important. And you know, the timing of of this webinar is um, it's right now we're in a really critical moment um, as we are now in the first year of the Biden administration. The Trump administration had the opportunity last August to list the Bradford Island site and surrounding waters of the Columbia River as a Superfund site or that national priorities list site and did not do so. Uh, and now we have uh, a new administration, many new officials at EPA, and this is a really critical moment. We're hoping in 2021 with strong leadership from the states of Oregon, Washington, Yakima Nation, other tribal governments that um, we will be able to convince EPA to list this area as a super fun site. And so this is your moment to get involved. Um, we have the link to our petition up on the slide. And after uh, this presentation, um, the next couple of days, I'll send you an email again with a recording of the presentation, um, a link to the petition, and it's already filled in. So you don't need to have taken your notes from the presentation to complete it, but you're also welcome to add your personal thoughts on why you think the site should be listed. Uh, and then in the future, you know, 
check out Columbia Riverkeeper's website. We have our take action link on our uh, homepage with all of the petitions that are available to sign. Um, and so with that, we've got uh, about uh, 10 minutes left. Thank you so much to those of you who emailed me questions, who've been putting them in the chat and on Facebook Live. Um, we're gonna start with a question for Davis and then Laura, if you wanna add anything. So the question is you know, specifically on um, Bradford Island itself. Um, before this area you know, was identified as having so much pollution, were there tribal fishing platforms on Bradford Island or was the island itself a, a place where uh, Yakima Nation tribal members or other tribal members were fishing? Uh, certainly there was. Uh, understand that the Yakima Nation was made up of a confederation of 14 tribes and bands, uh, nine of those uh, along the Columbia River. And uh, as the uh, land acknowledgement, uh, Lauren pointed out earlier, we also shared with uh, our relatives across the river, the Warm Springs, Wascos, and also uh, further down river. So as a matter of usage, there was always the uh, opportunity, the availability in the Bradford Island area, uh, as you've seen in one of the first photographs uh, before the dam was built, that there was, uh, uh, considerable knowledge of where uh, the uh, salmon would return. Uh, and so the platforms, uh, traditional fishing practices were used uh, throughout the Columbia River and, and the basin. So definitely, uh, as I stated earlier, uh, since the uh, beginning of time, uh, you know, we have utilized uh, all of our usual custom areas. So certainly Bradford Island, uh, as, and again, as a member of the one of the Klickitat uh, tribes, uh, larger tribes, uh, certainly this this would be um, uh, one of those dairy that we utilized, uh, you know, particular, uh, you know, uh, up and down this, this, including this area. So yes. Great, thank you, Davis. Um, so the next question, and Laura, I'll, I'll, I'm actually going to combine two questions and pass it to you. The first is whether that 2013 do not eat resident fish, fish advisory, if that's still in effect today. And then the next question was if you're aware of any human health studies uh, evaluating the impacts of some of the pollutants that you discussed um, or exposures uh, uh, here on, in the Columbia, the lower Columbia. Yeah, so the, the do not eat fish advisory is definitely still in place. And I think that's one of Yakima Nation's biggest, um, biggest concerns is that with a lot of these cleanup sites, the solution, the long-term solution has been to put a slap of fish consumption advisory on it instead of really prioritizing and getting the necessary funding and cleanup going. And so we would like to see health advisories reversed but we want to see them reversed because cleanup is truly happening and that it, it truly is safer to eat. Um, in terms of human health studies, the, you know, the toxicity numbers, those screening levels are based on, um, on toxicology studies. And a lot of toxicology studies are first done, you know, on aquatic organisms and um, it's harder to get human health studies. Um, I, am not a toxicologist. So what I can do is I, I do know a really good um, human health toxicologist that works at, at DEQ that I could call and maybe I could get that information to Lauren because um, it sounds like you'll be sending out an email afterwards. So I, I don't know of any PCB human health studies uh, personally, um, but I, I'll try to see if I can get something to Lauren. Thank you. Um, so the, the next question has to do with these resident fish that you discussed and um, you know, Davis spoke in, in great detail about the significance of salmon. Um, are, you know, in terms of other resident fish like sturgeon, um, are there other significant fish species that Yakima Nation is concerned about the impacts of uh, toxic pollution at Bradford Island? And, how that impacts um, the health of tribal members. And, and maybe Davis, if you could speak to that first and Laura, if you wanted to add. Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, we're, the Yakima Nation is concerned. As, as you know, 
Uh, what happens to one species uh, <laughs> definitely happens to another. Even though uh, our the salmon that we depend on, uh, you know, are migra migratory, um, and so, but the the resident fish there um, certainly are, are an indicator of something terribly wrong. And so, it's just like if you go to work every day, and and on your way to work, there's uh, toxic gases or vapor in the air, and you drive through it every day. You may not live there, but you pass through it, and uh, Definitely, it's gonna it's gonna affect affect you, and so we feel the same way. The river is a highway to the fish, just like we travel on highways. So that, and they have to go through it. And as far as the residents fish, uh, I believe the uh, uh, you know the sturgeon is is a part is a part of our diet, and so we have a concern uh, for those that uh, do not uh, you know migrate out to the ocean, and and again the concern definitely as stated earlier, we want to restore the Columbia River, uh, not only for ourselves, but for our neighbors and, uh, and for the future generations of, of, of all of the community, not just the Yakima Nation. So if it, if it hurts uh, some members of our community, then definitely we're concerned because that's an indicator of something terribly wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, um, I would just add to that a few things that uh, different tribal elders, including Davis, has passed along to me that really kind of uh, made me really um, realize like how how immediately and concerning and emergency important this is. And one of them was from an elder when I was on a crit vic tour, um, and I asked, you know, would would uh, tribal members that fish here would they eat? The resident fish, because you know these these tribal fishers are are fishing primarily for for the salmon that are passing through, which supposedly wouldn't be affected as much, um, nearly as much. And their answer to me was, "Well, it's hard to say. It's it's family by family dependent. Um, we are taught our our culture teaches us that every fish is a gift from the creator, and so if a family were to truly follow." that cultural teaching, they would not waste their bycatch. They would probably eat it. And other families might, might feel that, you know, the toxicity in that area is more important than the cultural teachings. And so it just, it would be family by family. Um, another thing, and, and Davis was the act, a person that actually taught me this, is that, you know, it's not really just the salmon that a, a person that a tribal member who is following their cultural, true cultural ways would, would practice. They would follow the seasons. And when the salmon runs came through, they would eat salmon. And the river would provide in other ways, whether it be through clams or crayfish or resident fish at other times of year. And so if someone were living in that area, which there are some fishing villages in that area, um, they, they would follow the river and, and let the river provide season to season to season. And if that, for some reason, if someday, if that, that area of Bradford Island were returned back to its natural state um, and people were to uh, be consuming fish and organisms from that area, because, and these are persistent, these are forever chemicals, they don't go away. So if they're not cleaned up or in some way, they will still be there a long time out. Um, if someone were to be collecting fish or crayfish or clams from that area, then that, that could be a very um, dangerous exposure scenario. Um, I have one final question, and uh, this one is for you, Laura. It's another exposure question. And you know, for many Columbia River Keeper members, the folks who are listening, this is the time of year when we're thinking about getting in the river. Uh, many folks are, have already been in the river swimming. Um, is this an area where people, are there signs saying not to swim in the river there? Have there been any studies done or is the exposure, the main concern here really around um, consumption of fish? Again, I probably a, a toxicologist would be better at answering this, but I'm gonna try my best. And if there's any corrections, I'll get those to you, Lauren. <laughs> but um, it, you know, really it's that tip of, of Bradford Island and the sediments and bedrock right around that tip of Bradford Island and perhaps Goose Island where 
the source of contamination is known to be located. It, um, and so, and those areas are so close to the dam that just for dam safety, there's all kinds of signs up at the fishing, the tribal fishing locations. There's also signs up about not eating resident fish. And uh, I think at different boat launches, there could be signs about that too. Um, but with the dam there and currently operating and continuing to operating, I think this the safety current concerns uh, surrounding the dam keep most people out of um, water contact and sediment contact. So really it's more of a fish eating concern in that one mile area. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, thank you to our speakers, Laura and Davis. This was a, an incredibly informative webinar. We are very excited that we were able to record it. We had so many folks who joined us live today. We'll have the webinar up on our website. I'll be sharing it with all of you over email. Um, I hope that you will, when you uh, get a copy of it, consider posting it on your social media feeds, um, as well as sharing the petition that we'll be sharing as well. Our goal is to have thousands of people flooding the US Environmental Protection Agency with petitions calling for action. And each of you who, who had a chance to listen in today are, are really part of that. And um, just finally in closing, I wanna thank our many members who made today's webinar and our whole Love Your Columbia webinar series possible. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to Columbia Riverkeepers email list and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and that way you can find out as soon as we release our upcoming summer Love Your Columbia webinar series and other great opportunities to take action on important issues that affect our climate and clean water. And also find out about incredible victories for clean water, um, whether it's working in solidarity with tribal nations or in communities up and down the river. Um, together, we are truly making a difference for this incredible river. And in closing, I want to thank the, my coworkers at Columbia Riverkeeper, our incredible communications team. Uh, thank you, Jamie Melton, our communications coordinator who ran the webinar today, and Liz Trahar and Gabriela Garcia on our communications team who helped to promote uh, this webinar. So thanks to all of you for joining, and a, a special thank you to you, Davis and Laura, for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you so much.